How y'all doing? Good. Yeah. Thanks for coming out. This is like pretty impressive. We're really psyched to have this many people who are interested in engaging in restoration out of conduct. So, um, yeah, so thank you. I know there's plenty of other things somebody could do on a spring spring evening. So, um, I'm Ray Vinke. I'm a scientist for the Natural Research Damage Program. I'm based in Butte, uh, working the Upper Clark Fork and Anaconda. Um, Doug Martin is here. He's the chief of the program in the back of the room there. Um, introduce you to a couple other folks who are working with us. Uh, Pedro Marquez, please stand up. Pedro's working with us. He'll be working with us in some degree of education. Uh, Carl Hemming is here from the county. Carl somewhere. There he is, the tallest person in the room. Um, <laughs> and then Mark and Rebecca in the front are going to be working with us in some of our open space plan. So, um, but yeah, really appreciate everybody being here. So I'm going to be talking to, we're going to talk to you about a potential amendment to the Anaconda Uplands Restoration Plan. That's the plan that's guided work that the Natural Resource Damage Program has done so far on Mount Hagen and Stucky Ridge. Um, we now have the opportunity to allocate some funds and specifically work on uh, county lands in Anaconda Deer Ledge County. And we're going to do that through an amendment to this restoration plan, which is guide that works since 2008. So, um, so with that, I'll, I'll start going. I did want to say, I don't mind interruptions. In fact, sometimes they're a good thing to you know, just collect ourselves and make it more of a discussion. So um, feel free as we go along. If you've got any questions or I'm not clear enough, just throw something out. Joe. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yes. And other housekeeping. Um, did everybody sign in? Please do. OK, great. Um, any other housekeeping, Douglas, or something else? I think that's it. Um, okay, so with that, I will give you guys some background about where we're going, and we can talk. So this is a meeting, <clears throat> not just for those of us who are sitting here in the room, but actually there are participants online as well. Um, so I just want everyone to be aware of the fact that we're all being uh, recorded, so I guess you know, be aware of that. Um, and as such, it's important when you stand up, please, when you have a question or a comment at some point, just stand up and say your name first. So we have that um, for our records and so everybody knows in person and remotely as well. So, and yeah, I guess that's it. Like I said, it's really exciting that this many people are here and um, interested in what we're doing. All right, so I'm going to briefly talk about the Natural Resource Damage Program, who we are, for those of you who aren't you know, familiar with the program. Um, also about the background for this amendment, which is, again, our uh, initial restoration plan from 2007, as well as the consent decree with, that we reached with Atlantic Richfield in 2008. I'll talk about how that has bearing to this amendment, which would address work on county lands specifically, and talk about some ideas the program has in terms of how we spend funds on county lands. Um, and lastly, and most importantly, tell everybody how to participate in this process. Um, tonight is an informational meeting, so we're not here to say, please give us all your detailed ideas about how to pursue restoration in county lands. We're here to say, Here's, you know, how to make the most um, productive comments. We have a comment period that's opening on June 9th in your attachment A in the in the memo, as well as online, so it tells you how to submit the proposals. But I'm getting a little of myself, but I'll just get into the program here. Um, so the Natural Resource Damage Program is a, is a statewide program. We're most well known for our work in the upper Clark Fork in Butte and Anaconda. Um, basically, our job is when there when there are releases of hazardous materials from industry into the environment, if there are damages that accrue, our job is to recover uh, funds for those injuries, 
then use those funds to restore, replace, rehabilitate, or acquire equivalent resources as those that were damaged. Um, so, and so we now have sites, actually a new site in Libby and into the Northwest and as far east as, as Glendive. So we have 14 sites in the state of Montana. Um, they're in various, some of those are places where we're already pursuing restoration. Others are sites uh, where we're, our work is limited to monitoring, excuse me. And we also have some new, new claims. So, but we are most well known for work, you know, in the upper Clark Fork. I think that's where people hear the program. Uh, some important work that we've done in Anaconda, I guess, um, actually there have been a lot of projects, but one is the Natural Resource Damage Program paid largely for a uh, new water system in Anaconda. Um, uh, also, actually, the Stewart Mill Bay campground was purchased entirely with Natural Resource Damage Program funds. Uh, the WMAs, Garrity Mountain, Blue Light and Alley, Stucky Ridge, those were largely paid with Natural Resource Damage Program funds. So, um, we've been working in restoration in, in this area for, well, since almost 20 years. Over 20 years. Um, yeah, so all, as all of us know, the Anaconda area and specifically the uplands were damaged by the emissions that resulted from smelting in Anaconda for over 100 years. Sorry, I have like a cold. Okay, so smelting over 100 years resulted in aerial transmission of pollutants, you know, not just immediately to Anaconda, but initially in the Deer Lodge Valley, ultimately into the into the big hole, there were damages of over hundreds of miles. Uh, the, and so those that was as a result of the emissions of the smelters, there was deposition of uh, copper, arsenic, cadmium, zinc that resulted in, uh, in some cases, landscapes that were completely denuded of the vegetation. As a result, um, the program pursued a first an injury assessment uh, to document what the, what the damages were from the smelter, and we pursued a settlement for um, gross damages to 18 square miles uh, that were on the smelter on Stucky Hill, just to cross on the north side of town. Um, in the smelter hill uplands, we call it, so around the smelter, smelter proper, and also Mount Bacon, where we identified as damage centers. Um, and in those areas, there was significant injury to vegetation, soil, wildlife, all those compromised um, the community's opportunity to recreate in, in wildlands that were impacted, as well as, of course, by the wildlife and plants themselves. Um, so the state did pursue the settlement with the Atlantic Richfield Company, and in anticipation of that settlement, we prepared a restoration plan in 2007. That's been our, our guiding document so far. Um, that's what we're going to be talking about, amending to include provisions for working specifically on council meetings. Uh, in 2008, we did uh, reach a settlement with Atlantic Richfield Company for uh, $13.3 million. Uh, under that settlement, we committed uh, the Natural Research Damage Program to do remediation on Stucky Ridge, so 480 acres of DNRC parcels there, as well as uh, state lands on Mount Bacon. Uh, that's not typical of energy. Usually we focus on restoration of natural resources, so that's after the cleanup has occurred. We then focus on uh, restoring lands to their condition before they were initially damaged. So, um, okay, where are we going? So yes, so there's there was a paragraph essentially in the original restoration plan that allowed for expenditure of up to $4 million in county lands once the state, once the NRDP 
had met our obligations for cleanup on Mount Hagen and Stuckey Ridge. Uh, just this spring, as of April 4th, the EPA certified that NRD actually had successfully completed remediation on, on Stuckey and Mount Hagen. So that's our trigger for why we showed up here today, is because the county's really excited, all the citizens that I've talked to and the program uh, to get to work on the county lands. So we're here to inform folks of the opportunity to guide that work and provide some more background. Um, one thing that's important to know is that Atlantic Richfield Company is responsible for remediation on county lands. It's not their natural resource damage program. So we did take, we did do the remediation on Stucky Ridge, Mount Hagen. We're going to continue to pursue restoration actions on, on uh, Mount Hagen and throughout the injury area. But the remediation, the cleanup of uh, hazardous materials that's been completed on Stucky and Hagen. Any questions? Let me give myself a pause and see. Okay. Anything? All right. All right. So the sign off by the EPA, like I said, on the, was our trigger to then release this memo on the 9th of May, which basically says. We've got $4 million work on county lands. Here's the background and in attachment A to that document you have in your hand, it, it you know, outlines how to make um, offer conceptual proposals on um, work that NRDP could do in concert with the county. Um, this map, fortunately, it's also in your handout, but it shows the suite of lands that we currently envision as being uh, places where we could spend these, these funds. And they include uh, the yellow lands, which are existing uh, county lands, as well as uh, the purple lands. There's 160 acres to the south and west of the courthouse shown there. That's the A Hill. So that's currently privately hold, held. Uh, but we, there's a fair chance it approves by the governor's office and this amendment proceeds um, as planned that a, the a hill will be purchased uh, by the county with funds for the natural resource damage. Um, so that's this, you know, purple wedge here, the a hill. And then the rest of the purple are lands that Anaconda Deer Lodge County is in discussion with British Petroleum as um, lands that could ultimately come to the county. So that's a sort of suite of lands that we're considering uh, being appropriate for expenditure of this up to four million dollars. Um, we've identified three main project types that would occur, uh, and they are revegetation and ecological restoration. Haver's going to talk to you a little bit about some of the work they've done on Mount Hagen that falls in that category. Um, also, potential lands acquisitions or acquisition of easements. As I mentioned, Garrity, Blue Eyed Nelly, and Stucky are places where um, Natural Research Damage Program has used funds before um, from another restoration. And then I know a number of you are interested in recreational planning and development. That's something we're also um, entertaining as a potential restoration opportunity for the Anaconda Geological So along those lines, we have, we have two all concurrent planning processes that are going to inform uh, the amendment that we prepare this fall. So first one is that uh, Anaconda Deer Ledge County has hired SCJ Alliance, their part, private uh, landscape architecture firm, to work on open space planning on county lands. Uh, and as part of that process to examine potential opportunities for trails development. So, and also um, Pedro with the Big Hole Watershed Committee is working with us to identify opportunities uh, to pursue some ecological restoration, including revegetation that would go above and beyond what's accomplished by gravity.
Okay, so um, so attachment A to the solicitation bound uh, that outlines uh, in detail, you know, what we'd like to see for conceptual proposals. Uh, but essentially, it's kind of who, what, where, when, why. So it's um, your name, a project purpose, and its potential benefits, where it would be located, a map would be great. And I, um, what the project, a description of the project, and how it would integrate with our existing restoration plans. So, like I said, revegetation, lands acquisition, um, and recreational development are all ideas that we consider, you know, to be appropriate opportunities. If people have other um, restoration actions they propose or something that fits underneath those categories, we'd love to hear about it. Um, also, part of this process is if uh, if there are any potential adverse impacts to the human or natural environment that people think may occur as a result of um, these, this work, then let us know. Let's, um, as part of the Montana Environmental uh, Policy Act, it's important that we scope any potential damages or impacts, adverse impacts to the environment. Um, sorry, this is a little bigger, but this is our. This is our schedule for this this anaconda amendment to the uplands restoration plan. Um, you know, where we're at now is May 24th, so we're here to, you know, just inform everybody of the opportunity and guide you in making offering any conceptual proposals. Um, at the June 9th, that's a key day. That's when we'd like delivered um, either through mail or email actual proposals, you know, as much as well fleshed out as people can. I mean, the truth is, you know, everybody doesn't have a day to spend preparing a proposal for NRDP as far as what's going to be done on land. So, you know, as as much information as you can provide, and that provides us a starting place to explore projects. Any projects, proposals that come in the door, we will give them full consideration, the more detail, the better. Um, but anyway, we, under, we understand that the level of specificity will depend on the level of folks' interest and time and experience working in the program. Uh, let's see, so this summer, again, uh, open space planning will occur, as well as more sort of examination of opportunities to do additional revegetation in Anaconda. Uh, and this fall, we'll use uh, that information to build the amendment itself. So as as well as you know the public inputs here. So basically, NRDP will take everything that we get from Agro and Mark in terms of you know what they envision um, their work shows or opportunities for open space conservation and for revegetation. And then I'll also take into account, you know, the public's proposals. Um, and with that information, we will build an amendment to that uh, guiding document, the upland, the Anaconda Uplands Restoration Plan. Uh, that document then will be out for public comment. Everybody will say what we have an offer to an opportunity to um, comment on it. And after we include response comment, you know, we'll finalize the document, which will be offered to the governor as the trustee of natural resources to approve or um, hopefully approve. So, you know, we're not approved, but um, so yeah, that's the, that's the process. Questions? Someone asked me a question. Wow. Alex, you're up this good for a question. Alex, uh, so, so there's yeah. four million dollars. So, how much did Jeff pay to be spent on the cable after this? Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, go, go ahead and repeat it. Oh, yeah. Identify yourself. Sorry, I'll have to stand up. Thanks. <laughs> study. My question was. There's four million dollars total, and they're going to do an acquisition on the day. I'm just wondering how much the day total cost. Right. So, 
Carl Hamming. Has the county negotiated a price for the A Hill? And is that appropriate to share? Carl Hamming um, <laughs> Okay. All right. Any anybody else? Yeah, please identify yourself. I know it's online. And are you going to the Yes. Um, not in detail, but if you would grab to be set of legal and technical criteria that all the we need to meet with Things like, is it duplicative of normal government function? Standard BP is not going to pay for something that the government should be expanding. Is it a good, you know, cost and benefit analysis? Um, how feasible a project is, you know, how well do they fit with their other restoration plans? So there's, oh, not quite a dozen of those, but they are listed in the attachment A to that panel. So what the criteria are that we talked about. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm trying to ask some If we only have just a little over two weeks, <laughs> yeah. That's not, I, was, um, I don't know what's going to happen, but as we get out in the summer next fall, next quarter, and we think of additional things, we can still bring projects forward while well there's one available. Yeah. Artists. You don't have to. We're lining up where we want to spend money. It's additional ideas, but we, we can still bring stuff. Next year, as long as there's money available within the scope of what you're trying to do, we can still bring ideas for this is at the end. Right. The the more information we have now, the better. But we can we can I mean, let's just say there was even a total change in course. We could make we could make another amendment to this plan. We you know we have demonstrated in you know the upper Clark Fork some of the restoration plans and the the program will. As every four years in the upper flag works and re examined our priorities and kind of where we're going to go. So that would be the case here. One thing, Chris, that's pretty neat about the fact that we plan these sort of concurrent processes is that as Mark and his group do additional work this summer, they'll be in touch with you, the community, and saying, Hey, what do you think about trails in the community? And I'll use that information to directly feed into the amendment. So that gives us a little bit more time right there. So. All right. So, um, yeah, if you're interested in a little more guidance on how to submit proposals, um, you know, the best you can just type in. Montana Natural Research Damage Program, and that will get you to, to our website. And we have our website split um, one by injured sites, as well as there's uh, there's uh, there, sorry, Doug, is, we have a public comment page, right? Is that right? I apologize. Yes. Do we have a, a page that's specifically public comments? Okay, so. It's, so so yes, yeah, so you can navigate through our website and find that public comment page, and that will provide you additional direction on how to submit comments as well. Um, and then you know you can reach out to me. Many you know me, or I'll be happy to hand out hand out cards as well, or or to Doug. So we can give you additional hints on you know what level of detail we'd like in terms of proposals. Oh, I'm up. That's it. Pedro's up. Okay, so so Pedro works. Well, he'll tell us uh, for the Big World Watershed Committee. He's done a ton of work on Mount Hagen with the Natural Resource Damage Program. That you know is um, well. 
contributed to the delisting of that one on the certification that uh, remediation had been been completed. I'm not Hagen. Hagen and his group were critical. He said he's an expert in you know ecological engineering and revegetation and uh, restoration techniques. So he's going to tell us about the work they did on Mount Hagen and how that might apply to county lands. Sorry. Name? I know Name. you. Uh, Name's uh, Rosen with the paper. Yeah. Is there like a preference on the how much money can go to land how much for a preparation? No, we don't have that identified at this at this juncture. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Agree yeah, sure. Chris, do you think so? How's this going to interact with the open space plan and maybe questions? Yeah, let's um, Carl's going to follow Pedro and we'll we'll let Pedro take the stage and talk about uh, restoration techniques and how they and what they've done. Good. And the questions for oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so I came at this work uh, in 2009 with a contractor out of Missoula Watershed Consulting. We were hired as the steep slope reclamation uh, contractors for Anaconda Uplands. So that was the Uplands and Stucky Ridge. So we worked on, you know, looking at a pretty degraded piece of ground and figuring out what's worth doing. Do it, you know, for the amount of money that's available, um, and basically restore ecological processes and vegetation communities. So we have a lot of expertise in that. Um, Y'all might be asking, like, well, big holes like on the other side and drains to the other ocean. Um, when I moved over to the watershed committee, I brought project work as a consultant to the committee. They said you should start doing this in-house. And my former boss let me bring the contract with me. Um, so we're a nonprofit organization that does a whole lot in the big hole, but uh, our board has allowed us to sort of guide and facilitate this process because of the expertise that we've developed over all these years. Um, part of the reason there's four million bucks for Anaconda Deer Lodge County is because I didn't charge enough for 10 years on the other work. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but we were able to do what we did really effectively. Uh, we were given initially the plan from Arco was stop all the sediment from coming out of the mountains. And to do that, you're going to build gigantic cement uh, catchment basins, and you're going to maintain those in perpetuity. That means forever. Like every year, going in with an excavator. And if all of you, if anyone's been up in the Mountain Hagen game range, that means digging out beaver ponds, putting in a human beaver pond, and then maintain that forever with diesel fuel. That was not palatable to FWP. So it took us a long time to sort of come up with a set of techniques that is better than that. That was proposed by Argo. We were able to change the remedy um, and created a much more, I think, ecologically robust, cost-effective, set of tools that can be applied and I think they're very relevant to the lands that you all have here. Um, the other thing they told us Arco said we had to do was plant 450 stems an acre. So for many, many years I sent many, many very well taken care of nursery plants to their death on Stucky Ridge and on like god awful slopes in Mount Hagen. Um, We've learned a lot in that process. There are still many, many plants living and thriving, and you can see them when you look over at Stucky Ridge. Uh, a lot of stuff has worked. So uh, long story short, that that's kind of the, the lens we're going with is um, what can we do that really boosts the ecological vitality of the landscape according to what folks want to see out there? Um, I don't have a reference point that I'm designing to. Right. I don't have like a period of time in my mind that is when this place was the way it should be. Um, I think I'm open to what the community wants to see here. And then critically, it, it'll be hard to do restoration without understanding what the recreation in open space planning is going to look like up there. So those two things really have to 
move at the same time. I'd almost say the recreation and access comes first and then the restoration comes on top of that. Um, or in, you know, in parallel. Um, just to describe a little bit of the approach, I, I kind of set it up like we had a prescription for a very engineer heavy sort of intensive process. And what we came up with is the opposite. It's iterative and adaptive. So we did a lot of pilot projects, understood how the landscape reacted to them, went back, adjusted, tweaked, learned from what from mistakes, and then kept going. So um, y'all are set up pretty nicely. We don't have to do a lot of the, the, the growth curve that we went through in the uplands. Um, we've, we've really learned a lot and kind of have a, a great toolbox to jump off from. So iterative and adaptive is, is kind of how I like to, to see things. You know, Chris, you asked a question about if ideas come up in the future. Yeah, I, I feel like, you know, I won't speak for the NRD program, but that's how it's happened in the past. And there, there's been a lot of room for that kind of iteration with this work. Um, again, I talked about jumpstarting natural recovery. So that means if, if on the mountainsides, if we have excessive erosion, we want to get vegetation established on them. Uh, if there's big gullies transporting sediment too fast out of the landscape, we want to check those gullies up, um, catch that sediment. That's where the seeds are going to germinate and vegetation will sort of come back if we stop large scale erosional processes. And then where we do have flowing water, um, you know, make sure that those systems are functioning hydrologically. We don't you know, water is precious. We don't want all the water that's abundant, like now. We don't want it all necessarily gushing off the mountains as fast as possible and leaving everything high and dry come August, September. So just some sort of high level, just ways that I think about these landscapes. Um, and then the other considerations really, uh, that's that's maybe the, the, the big one. Um, as I walked here, I, I've been kind of, Looking a little bit at the ANC Hills over the years, um, there's some clear points where motorized access, motorized recreation is taking place. Um, you know, as decisions are made about what's going to be allowed where, we'll know what's left to restore. Like, I don't want to go in, for example, somewhere where folks are going to be riding dirt bikes and try to like restore a hillside if someone's just going to be driving their dirt bike right over it every year. Right, that'd be a waste of time and effort. So. If that gives you some kind of sense on how this is going to go, at least from our standpoint. Um, and then, yeah, there's lots of questions along the way about uh, biodiversity, what types of plants, what types of communities, um, and we'll take cues from you all. So, uh, you know, even if I know two weeks is not a long time, but even general guidance, like what used to be up here that you all enjoyed, like. Were the aspen groves bigger? Were they smaller? Do you hate them? Do you want more of them? <laughs> you know, we can adjust the vegetative communities through our through our restoration. These are things that we can do. Um, do we want to see more trees? What type? Pine trees, right? Um, and we'll incorporate those types of ideas, even if they're very very general. Um, we'll keep those in mind as we as we plan. Um, that's mostly it. Um, I. I it's such an early kind of phase, um, but this is just kind of an example. This is on the continental divide. It doesn't get harsher than this. It's 100 degrees in the summer. It's negative 40 in the winter. The wind's blowing all the time. Um, that dirt, when we started, we thought was going to be super toxic. We thought the pH was going to be like Stucky Ridge, like 3.2, you know, like orange juice. It's not actually. Um, a lot of the bad stuff has walked away a long time ago. So it's really just physical factors and nutrient limitations were keeping vegetation from growing on those hills. And we've kind of cracked that code a little bit to figure out how to make that happen. So um, I'll just sort of leave you with that. That's just an example of what, what we've been able to pull off. And, and there's similar types of ground up here um, that we'd be looking at getting uh, self-perpetuating native vegetation is the goal. Unless everyone in the room says, no, we need some sort of non-native plant and that's what you want. And then that might be a problem, but, you know, y'all are driving. Any questions?
Yeah. Uh, where did we get any considerations for fire in landscaping with the proliferation of fire in the U.S. and climate change and so many people? So, are there any ideas of that being considered? Um, so I, I won't speak for the county or the energy program. I will say our work in the big hole. We have a lot of, you know, ranchers and, and landowners in the big hole are concerned about fires. And there is documented pretty clear that the, the tree line has been creeping down the mountainsides and down the hills and are existing way closer to where people live than it ever used to. And we do uh, a lot of restoration type projects that does try to move that tree line back up and remove conifers uh, to reduce the fire risk and things like that. Um, aspen and conifer behave very differently in regards to fire. Um, you know, ecologically speaking, I think aspen groves are, are more resilient to fire and, and are an indication that you've got more available water and last I checked, water doesn't burn. So. That's, you know, that's that's certainly something, an important consideration and things that should be put in in some of your else's comments. If that's something to worry about. And other folks that will be joining us um, real quick, I can have Ben LaFleur, he's our restoration programs manager for the Big Hole Watershed Committee. Ben, you want to raise your hand, stand up? Um, he took over my job when I became the director, and Allison Allen is a conservation fellow with us from uh, the Montana Conservation Corps. Will be with us from May to October and helping out. So that's kind of our team from the new whole side. Pedro, uh, uh oh, Jim, you're in one on sports as well. Uh, me and Gary helped you that one time taking the netting down. Yeah, on various plants. Some probably done better than others. Yeah. But you've got that catalog. Did you ever try fir trees up in here? There's some dead fir up there. Okay. Yep. Not many, but yeah. That the 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 nursery planting, you know, you got to keep in mind for for a plant. At the end of the day, we were somewhere in the ballpark of $70 per plant installed, which is which gets expensive. Um, because we were planting the plant in basically a desert we were putting a little nutrient pack with every tree and we knew the mule deer would just love that so then you got to put a plastic net with two stakes and zip ties around that and if the wind blows that off you got to go back and maintain that so that's a it, it became a very resource intensive proposition to do a, a large scale tree planting and we found that the mule deer they were just like lollipops. I mean, every lodge pole is just like kapoom, kapoom, kapoom. They would just walk through and just pick them up one by one. That was in a situation where there was nothing else to eat, and we were just putting little green lollipops on the landscape, right? We're in a different situation now. Natural revegetation in a lot of this ground is, is already existing, so it's, it's not the same situation. Um, but I do have a little bit of PTSD from Planting the logical pine for mule deer since watching the <laughs> Um It could happen. I mean, probably won't. Not like, not like it was out there. Maybe it was for the trees. We planted limber pine, horizontal juniper, Rocky Mountain juniper, uh, choke cherry, service berries. Woods grows. Those are most of the, the stems that are planted. But then we've also found that natural recovery is the way to go. There is a native seed bank ready to pop if you give it the right stuff. All right. And then we have Carl Davis, um, I don't protect this from the county. Thank you, Bader. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Pedro. Thanks, Ray. Uh, so again, I'm Carl Hanning, uh, the planning department for Anaconda County, Bureau of County. Um, it's already been touched upon a bit this evening. Uh, the county recently hired SEJ Alliance. We've got two members of that crew here in the front. 
Um, and so they are going to be assisting the county this summer with this open lands planning effort. And so what exactly that's going to entail is something that uh, we're still trying to wrap our heads around, quite frankly. As Ray showed in that earlier map, the county is potentially situated to acquire quite a bit more acres from Atlanta and Richfield. And so the first thing we really want to do is wrap our heads around what is the condition of the property? Um, you know, we know the C Hill, the A Hill, they've got a number of trails on them, as Pedro talked about. I mean, you can see motorized use there, you know, which is great and exciting when it's done right. Unfortunately, we have some places where we see a lot of stormwater runoff and uh, erosion issues. And so we want to just know the status of the lands that we currently own and that maybe we'll, we'll own, uh, hopefully, in the near, near ish future. Um, thanks, Ray. And so, SCJ Alliance, they're going to help the county just really do this inventory of what we've got, what's working, what's not working, where are trails in existence, hiking, biking, motorized, non motorized, equestrian, whatever, uh, just so we can see what people are doing on the land right now. And like I said, what's working, what's not working. So then we can start to develop a plan that will uh, try to bring, all, bring in all these different types of user groups and put it into a plan that hopefully with our uh, efforts with the natural resource damage program can uh, bring this into a recreational system that you know, the, the whole community is excited about something that um, you know, every type of users can be jazzed to be out there uh, running playing um, you know hiking biking whatever so we uh we're tasking SCJ Alliance with a lot. I mean, this is a huge chunk of acreage. We know we've got trail issues, weed issues. And then as Pedro was all talking about too, that we want to make sure we're doing these recreational features in logical places. Uh, we don't want to see them all torn up, um, you know, with the, or to see the restoration torn up by recreation or recreation get in the way of, you know, important ecological restoration projects. So trying to marry these two very different but important uh, subjects together. So, um, you know, we're going to have a lot of communication between the three of us, SCJ Alliance, Pedro, and one thing that really want to emphasize tonight, uh, especially for the folks who signed in, you know, we're going to be pushing out surveys. We're going to have some stakeholder meetings. We want to hear ideas from you, Chris. You talked about it earlier that you know, not to uh, take away from the deadline from the Natural Resource Damage Program, but if you have further ideas with especially the open lands planning effort, you know, those are things that we can fold in this summer into uh, this coming fall that we you know, really want to have you know, all these ideas thrown about. But some won't be eligible for uh, the NRDG funding. You know, if we want to do uh, Our Lady of the Rockies 2.0 or something like that, I'm guessing Ray's not going to pay for that, but it's still something that can be discussed, thrown out there, talked about in the plan, and uh, you know, see if we can develop a nice system around that. So really, um, that's all I kind of want to touch upon. Unfortunately, Rich had to go you know, kind of keep it up with uh, this perfect question there, but any thoughts, questions on that? Chris, the first part from the mic. Just gonna solve here. But um, you know, we're all focused on what we could use this for uh, habitat for recreation versus habits. A lot of this land is right on the border of town, and um, we clearly need places also to build houses. So, how does that factor into some of these plans? How do you look at that and balance maybe the opportunities to put in some residential housing development? I, I don't think we need any more. We don't need to stop the flow of five acre lots, but how do we develop opportunities for residential development in, in some of this? And are, so we don't overlook that in just saying, oh, we'll send it to residential. Sure. Um, I'm shocked to hear you ask that question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was the <laughs> um, but honestly, uh, the simple answer on these lands is there's going to be land use covenants and restrictions on those properties and acreages that will preclude any sort of residential development or commercial development. And so, I mean, yes, the county is looking around. We're trying to figure out where can we grow, where can we further develop, where can we run municipal services that make it more logical, efficient connections. But at the end of the day, these lands, Sea Hill, A Hill, Stuff Run, Smelter Hill, this is not where 
we want to develop or where we can feasibly develop. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and given the flip side of that, it would be really helpful if we could see the ownership of the lands around these pieces. So that we don't overlook critical access that could possibly be part of that. So can we get a map of what's surrounding this so we know the ownership of it? The rest of the problem. I think that's a great early task of our uh, mark here at SCJ Alliance to work on those sort of mapping projects. Yeah. 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 We're just here for, for questions and information. Thanks. Um, yeah, so can you, you can toss the question. Sorry. Last slide. Good point. So tonight questions, but please, if you can, get us some proposals by, by June 9 at this. So you can, you know, Email them as well as uh, mail them. Reach out to myself individually, and I can give you some direction in terms of you know where to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, do so you have any thoughts or anything to offer? This is Doug Martin. I'm Doug Martin. I'm with the National Research Damage Program, and, and want to thank Ray and the entire organization over here. Uh, Presentations as well as everybody showing up. It's really great to see um, this uh, things. Uh, the, the one there was a question earlier about uh, you know how, how do we rank these or how are we going to take all this information in and rank it? Uh, this is a kind of a two-step process. Uh, this first step is a you know a sculpting information gathering uh, process. So looking at what uh, projects the folks of Anaconda are interested in, and then putting that together into, into this amendment. Following that is, is another whole other public comment period where, you know, to Chris, to get part of your point is, if there's another project later on in the day, um, yes, that could be inserted in the, in the draft restoration plan for a draft amendment stage as well. Um, so, it, you know, there, there's several steps to incorporate things in. Uh, also, to get to your point, one of the things that we try to do with the restoration plan is we don't try to lock ourselves in so tightly that we couldn't go outside, we couldn't do something uh, that's not specifically a project that somebody submitted. So, for instance, the work that Pedro does, it would be a lot of flexibility in uh, his, his ability to, to try different species or try different techniques to, to do something. Um, or, you know, I do see, uh, you know, Brian with EPA and, and Gordon with DEQ here from the remediation side. If ARCO actually does something that we could integrate to it, if the plan would be written such that we could integrate with that as well. So um, there is flexibility there. Uh, to get to the point about um, the, the, how we rank projects, I do want to tell them, right, all of the, the information that, that Ray had up on the screen, uh, there are all the handouts, all that information is in the handout. If you didn't get one, <laughs> there are extra ones over there by the, the trees and the sign sheet if, if you want to grab one. And that also provides a lot of information about how we do evaluate and rank projects. Uh, under the natural resource damage provisions, uh, under the, the federal law that we have to work under, there are certain criteria that we have to evaluate in the project with to make sure it is eligible for the funding that we have received. The funding we received was, as Ray pointed out, was from a lawsuit under the Natural Resource Damage Law. And so we have to spend that money per those, per that law, per those requirements of that. And in that, and in that handout, it does list those provisions. It's you know technical feasibility, um, what's the cost benefit, the cost effectiveness. How does it uh, 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 coordinate with the response action that EPA and DEQ are overseeing? 
you know, we don't want we want to make we want to make sure that the restoration action doesn't undo our remedy action. Um, then all of a sudden we become liable for it. So we, we don't want to go there. So we have to evaluate all of these projects. And from that, they do get right. <laughs> More specifically to, to your question of how we write the most recreational projects, it's been my experience. I've been with Burbank for a few years. And uh, recreation projects are ranked by you folks here. Um, very uh, good recreation projects uh, get, a, get a lot of public support. And, and I know there's several people here that have all, uh, worked with the program and we actually had a grants program. Uh, if it was a good recreation project, there was a lot of public support for that project and that would rise to the top. Uh, so through the public process, the public comment periods, that's how we rank those projects by taking the input from the public and then uh, moving that forward into the uh, the amendment that we will be, will be drafted. With that, from the end of it, is that how the end of it comes after planning is implemented back to us, or is it based on how the matter of the gets supported certain types of projects? Or what's the definition? So, so the question was, was how, how does that public kind of, how do we integrate or how do we look at that? Is it the number of uh, letters of support uh, or is that him? Am, am I? Yeah. yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. It, 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 if we got a thousand letters of support for a trail going across the, the ridge, yeah, I would, you'd say, well, that's going to, the cost benefit to that the project is going to go way up because what it costs to put there, there's going to be a lot of use on that project. So there's a higher cost benefit versus a trail with, you know, the only two people supporting it and, and not many people supporting it. And that's the part as opposed to June 9th? Uh, no, that most of, yes, well, that will be considered on June 9th, but most of that public comment on that type of thing will actually be during the draft restoration period in, in the fall that, that when, uh, and there will be another public meeting on that draft restoration time. And plenty of time to find Uh, you know, if, I did get an email or a text. If you are going to state your name, if you could make sure you speak loud enough so that this little owl thing up here can hear you, can hear you when you speak loud and find the call to the Jason Brooks, local residents. When you hear it's like you're asking for local input, like a flush down to the voters. He's curious how things that you're working with in a country society. So I'm sure they have a lot of different views. So we're just in the beginning phases, right? Like I mean, it's good that I to emphasize that. You know, we're here to grab to let folks know an opportunity in the next couple of weeks to provide conceptual ideas. Like, get some ideas. But I think it's really, it is going to be helpful over this summer to work with these other planning members. And I know when the kind of trail society has really been putting a lot of thought into this already. I don't know, Alex, or just maybe my speech better. <laughs> uh, speaking a little bit. So, Alex, we have a country society, our resident Bob. Um, we have, and you guys should show the club to come to those meetings. But the last couple of meetings, we have been talking about just developing like a list of basic recommendations for this land. What wants to sign up again? Trail that spots, the basic like revisiting the trail corridors, stuff like that. So that's something that we're kind of going to propose to them as a group. So, that. Oh, there's a meeting. Oh, yes, there's a meeting next Wednesday, thirty first. We're going to have popcorn and drinks. And it's going to be here. I, and this Chris Marsh, I'll get it for I just add on to that that um, hopefully what you look at is developing some of these experiment sites. And, and I, as I think about you know, the excellent trail system we have kind of here over the lower side is just it's great. 
you look at you go up to Catherine's Dam, you know, man, it's really it's nice. It's paved, it's got a lot of us there. It's, you know, there's plenty of them that people use a lot. You, you go down to uh, Cedar Park, where you take your old roads trail up there. And it's good. That's a, that's a good site. But then you go east of town, and you go out behind the town park, and um, in all the last 20 years or whatever, I go up there quite a bit. Um, it's been okay, but in the last three or four years, you see a lot more people using it. It's just a, it's a mud hole road. It, yeah, it goes some rocks or stuff, and, it, and especially in the winter time, you see the use drop off part of it because it's 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 not plowed and stuff. So, it, but part of it, you get stuck out there really easy when the wind's blowing and drifts in and stuff, and so. I think as we look at these, um, there's a lot of the people that come out here, when I go out there, there's a lot of people that go out there that are not as adapted to going out in the mountains and hiking and stuff. They, they, they got, there's somebody from town that's just got a two-wheel drive car or whatever again. So I think if you go forward, if we get to make sure we develop appropriate sites out there. And I again, but I would when I say that, I don't know that we necessarily want to use all the other money to develop these things. We've got a job course center up here that we can use. And, and I think that there are a lot of other buddies who have WP and other programs that deal with those trail sites. So when we can go use those bodies rather than we can use this NRB money for more the on ground stuff that we don't have other funds on our side, I'm curious that. Great board, our boxing bridge, and Mount Hagen, 
So yeah, we're we're here. I mean, Chris's comment was on Mark as Carol's others. I mean, you know, two weeks obviously isn't a lot of time to present a detailed idea about you know where a trail is nothing to do or something. So that's why we have you know have Mark and his group. They're going to be doing an online survey, right? Mark, do you want to describe a little bit about what you guys are thinking? Because that's going to be another opportunity in terms of recreation and open space planning to provide inputs to NRDP. Because I'm going to roll in all the work that Hayden and Mark do in the associated public inputs into the amendment that I build this year to the Uplands plan. Thanks. So uh, as has been mentioned, I'm Mark Garp with SCV Alliance. I'm a landscape architect. And I'm joined by Rebecca Rago, who's a landscape designer in my office. And we also have some planners who are going to help us out in looking at some of these open lands areas and thinking about recreation, how we can uh, you know, best use them um, and also not get in the way of the remediation and the restoration. Um, so part of our public process will be reaching out to specific groups like the sportsman's group is here tonight, the trails group, uh, and if there's anyone else here tonight that wants to meet with us, uh, that would be great. Let us know. Um, we'll be doing some stakeholder meetings, uh, and then eventually we'll be putting together, uh, I think it'll be a pretty comprehensive online survey. That's after we have our some of our mapping done, and we can show you what we're thinking and gather your feedback on it. So I think that's roughly the public outreach plan, but there's definitely some flexibility. So that's what we'll be doing. Great. All right, James, do you have anything that would be helpful for the paper in terms of informing our public or questions? Yes, it is. Okay. Something I hadn't thought of, and it's a good idea. That's why we have. Um, yeah, so you're wondering if there'd be a way for the paper to help solicit ideas? Is yeah. That correct. Okay. I haven't thought that through, and it's something that we can be in touch with. I think it's a good, I think that's a good thought. So, um, All right, so at least in the, well, I don't, I don't know. Do we have anything else? I don't see any other questions? Okay, go it's ahead, Chris. Yeah. Here. What's the feedback? What's the next time? There's some things that could happen over the next few months. Are you going to hold another one of these or get some feedback from the public in three months, six months? Yeah, I think. Yeah, the next, the next points for input are working with, you know, Carl or with, um, SCJ Alliance, that group relative to trails work. And then, I mean, honestly, I'm accessible and will incorporate com comments, you know, generally from the public. I mean, the more we have written proposals, it's really helpful. Um, but we are available to, you know, as we think through some of this, to just a phone call is okay. You know, that will, that will all inform what the decisions we make. Okay, appreciate that. Chris, if this is done, Mark, the next formal 
commentary to be with the draft restoration. So that's for the more the most great that you're talking about here is in that draft, which is a three seconds for the following. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? No. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Okay. So it's going to be uh, five to the governor for consideration. What's the plan if the governor gives you know how? <laughs> you know, I haven't had that experience yet, Doug. <laughs> so, so for the so natural resource damage funds that have been recovered by the state of Montana, uh, the governor is the trustee of those funds. And that being said, the governor does have the final say. Um, I can speak from the 20 plus years experience that I've been with the program. There's others here that can, can uh, probably back me up that have been with the program or worked with our program for a long time. But the, uh, the process that we go through is very open to the public and all the past administrations um, and the current administration have listened to the public and what that public has desired to respond. There are some instances where um, the, the governor has, has taken it into action. Um, last administration, Governor Bullock did that and, and moved uh, swiftly to allocate funds to do a large uh, restoration project that is due to from taking out the fair account. Um, it did still go through a public process, but that was you know something that that governor related. So, um, I would suspect, um, and from my uh, experience with this uh, governor, that he has listened um, to our recommendations and has not made any. He has not made any big changes to any of the restoration plans that we have been uh, working on. So, um, I would encourage you to um, to have your your fellow citizens uh, participate in this program and. And, and let us know uh, what you would like, because I do believe that um, what you guys say, there is a lot of weight back in on and, and how this, these funds will be going to I guess I, I can't guarantee you anything, but I can guarantee you that uh, we will take your comments forward to the, to the government and let them know that you're out of it. Right, Chuck. Just that reminds me years ago, and maybe it's still the same. The landlord had these also had positions also. Is that still part of the rule chart? That that is if the, if the property goes to uh if all by the parts of the NRC in this case going to the uh the county of Minnesota. Um so I believe I'm correct in saying this did not go to the yeah. and go ahead. We still have the NRD divided. Um, so there, so this this fund, which is associated with a separate settlement, you know, um, the consent decree for the Anaconda Uplands does not have a specific advisory board. So there's an advisory board for funds for U Area One as well as for the Upper Clark Park Restoration Fund, but this is a separate box. So to speak. So it's not governed by any of those decisions. Revegetation damage, erosion, and false and unplanned. Remediation of the need for the land. Where that boundary is, and where you know what we are trying to do. That's right. It's not that different. <laughs> no, 
Yeah, I haven't spoken this remedy restoration language for a few years. So maybe you can help me out, but it's it's our level situation. Yeah. I mean, so the way I saw it, the way I was tasked with it, contamination, which was our charges, contamination, uh, contaminated sediments were seen to have been entering waterways. So that was sort of the remedy that we were proposing was stop the sediment from getting into water. And we accomplished that in some of the steep slopes by revegetating, like you said. So you can see that in the remedy. Um, in the case of, it sort of blended very nicely on the game range because their management objectives were also more grassland than a conifer for the elk. And so the way we went about revegetating and doing our gully plugs, I feel like we were able to sort of blend the two. Um, so we accomplished the remedy and we also restored the landscape or, or created a vegetative community that's sort of recovery and according to what the land manager wanted to see. Right. So the 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 specifics of like the game range and wildlife management was always in the back of our mind as we designed the remedy. So in this case, that's what I'm saying, sort of the public use of the ground, in my mind, is going to guide a lot of what the land use of this place is, and that will help inform the techniques that we apply. Does that make sense? Um, my next question is, can you have a slower speed specific modeling that we're making? Right. And again, like I, I think that, that that sort of overarching sort of what is this land for is part of the, the concept that we're asking you all to help us define right now. I don't know, you know, is this help summer range right here? Exactly. That's not, I don't know. Um, is that what we want? That, that's that's really for, for you all to define, I think. And then and then we will suggest the techniques and then these guys will. Yeah, but that's kind of the, the remedy restoration. I remember that being sort of a rabbit hole of the conversation that I never quite understood. I don't know if Doug, you figured that out. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it, it is challenging. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this is the So remediation restoration. Uh, under remediation, that's something we do, and, and, and EPA are responsible for. And our is didn't mention remediation in this area. Their action, their um, implementation of, of work is to protect human health and the environment. And where restoration is, is actually to help restore that area toward a base two or toward a baseline condition. A lot of the sites here. Bringing it back to a baseline condition is probably not feasible. One, we don't have enough funds, and two, um, some of the, the land is, has has changed so much from other uh, other aspects of, of uh, human development and that type of thing too. So in this case, you know what Ray talked about is Arco has the remediation responsibilities on uh, all of the county-owned land uh, that are surrounding in Anaconda here. They are taking actions as directed by EPA and DEP to, that will protect human health and the environment. What we will do with working with Pedro from a restoration standpoint is look at what they are doing and using their expertise, what else could we do with these restoration funds to help uh, to do, take additional restoration actions? Well, if that will either help those that potentially could help those uh, managers recover faster. So instead of taking, you know, 50 years to totally recover, they might recover in, in 25 or something like that. Um, or uh, take additional actions that, you know, will have more direct uh, benefits uh, in the shorter term. You know, planting larger tree species or shrub species or something like that. So uh, depending on where we are in the landscape, um, and then what has already been done here will actually direct what the restoration actions will be. But specific to the, the county lands here, we do have to wait until remedy is done. 
Um, and or at least we, we know what exactly we know what we will be doing so that we can integrate appropriately. Um, because we don't want to be doing we don't have enough restoration dollars to do remedy on all the county grants, um, nor do we want to do something that's going to undo remedy. Um, and then, yeah, we, we become responsible for that. Did I talk enough when I confused you, or did it better? I think I get it. And then, you said earlier, but the remediation has been done among the days that we have the same degree of the rest of the I don't know if there's remediation done on any of them. I don't know. I couldn't say. No, most of much of uh, Atlantic Richfield's work to be done on this side is yet to be accomplished. Most of the work that's on Stucky Ridge has already been. So uh, uh, behind the courthouse, there's significant work planned for for twenty for this summer actually for twenty twenty three. So um, and yeah, so there's there's work yet to be done. And we'll, we'll be around afterwards for more discussions, and I'm sure he's made a deal after I don't know, but I'm putting him in the spot. Oh, yeah. If you want to <laughs> you introduce yourself, please. Okay, sure. Yeah, I'm uh, Brian Wolfar. I'm the uh, new uh, EPA project manager for uh, the Pudding and Pond site, and uh, I'm uh, taking over from the long term work in. And the previous uh, project manager at Charlie Poland, I uh, would be retiring next month. Uh, you know, there's just been a uh, site wide consent decree as a bit of a settlement agreement with the uh, Darko to kind of finalize the, uh, some of the, their responsibilities and plans uh, for the uh, completion of the remediation. Um, and so that is the completion of that remediation is sort of you know, planned and and an insight um, in uh, through decades of, uh, of work by you know, a lot of a lot of different folks, and um, you know I think this anaconda site is is somewhat unique in that that NRG actually had the uh, responsibilities in the remediation through their kind of in the sense of state lands, southern state lands, and yeah. So so uh, parts of Stucky Ridge and uh, mm -hmm. North Chicago that not uh, in the uplands. Where their uh, mediation and, and, uh, and restoration sort of overlapped. So I think they kind of talked about that. You know, their uh, their restoration work was also uh, preventing the flow of sediment. So taking these sort of denuded areas and uh, um, and and uh, 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 re uh, you know replanting, adding, uh, stopping uh, sediments from getting into. Uh, into uh, Mill Creek uh, from Mount Hagen, uh, and the sort of the same uh, same techniques, even immediate areas, uh, provide a sort of added ecosystem and recreational value. Uh, so, kind of being able to have this conversation, and, uh, kind of have the day for the input of how to use the land now for uh, recreation, uh, sort of as a testament to the success of all the decades of uh, past uh, remedial. You know, success. And, uh, you know, for any kind of specifics, I suppose we'll, we'll have to, to uh, you know, we'll be working with the energy about the timing of uh, when the uh, restoration kind of activities would happen. Uh, I think there wouldn't really be any, um, well, any problem for anything that's not inconsistent with the remedy. <laughs> Use a double negative there. Um, but, uh, I think, yeah, there, there will be future future public meetings from uh, from EPA, and uh, and of course we uh, you know in regular uh, communication with uh, their colleagues at Death and Energy, and uh, we'll uh, kind of work on things like timing based on the specifics of of uh, whatever gets selected through this process. Okay. Carl, anything else from the county's end or is everybody? Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job.
So yeah, please do um, take a look at that memo. If folks don't have it, you want me to email it to you. Just approach me, and I'll give you a card, and I can get you that that memo that will outline our near term process. Okay. Thank you. Very Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.